Editorial by Anna Mountford Zimdars, voiced by Paul Guillory. Dear colleagues, our students in higher education and at King's are more diverse than ever before. How does this affect how educators reflect on their role of supporting student learning in higher education? What are the opportunities for drawing on the strengths of diversity in a classroom? How can technology be embraced to enhance learning for diverse students? The eight contributors to this special issue have thought about what diversity or the lack of diversity means in their teaching context. In addition, the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning, CTEL, has provided an overview of how the present special issue has been made accessible. All contributors work as educators at King's College London. Their contributions to this special issue describe their own practice and initiatives to enhance student learning in the context of diversity. Their reflections and reviews are honest, insightful and thought-provoking. Students at King's come from as far afield as New Zealand and China, as well as our local community in London. They come from different cultural, national and social contexts. Some consider themselves disabled, some not. Some students are returning to study after a break or as graduate students. Many undergraduate students continue straight from secondary education. Some students prefer learning by doing. Others prefer learning by listening, observing or reflecting. Our students come with different expectations and abilities to navigate the complex space of higher education curricula. They have had different educational journeys to reach the point of embarking for study at King's. They have different commitments outside of studying and different levels of support from friends and families for their studies. Students might live with family members in halls of residence or privately. They may or may not engage vividly in the extracurricular activities at King's. The educators at King's are themselves a diverse group of nationalities, cultures, teaching philosophies and technophilia, united by underlying motivations for having chosen to work in higher education. Both educators and students are still learning to negotiate their roles and expectations of each other in the recently marketised higher education system. Simultaneously, technology is advancing rapidly. Lecture capture is widely available and King's is experimenting with open online courses. There are new, innovative ways to engage students with a range of learning styles, preferences and abilities in an inclusive, universally designed classroom. The present collection of eight essays shows how educators are thinking of the diversity in their teaching context the essays were originally submitted as assignments for the option module Teaching in the Context of Diversity, which is a part of the Postgraduate Certificate in Academic Practice at King's Learning Institute. Eight participants with particularly insightful submissions within the two preceding years, 2013 and 2014, have enthusiastically agreed to be part of this special issue. They have taken the feedback from their original assignment, as well as additional comments from King's colleagues to further enhance their original submissions. Half of the eight pieces in this special issue are reviews and the other half are reflective case studies. The reviews focus on reviewing the literature in a field and linking it to practice, whereas the reflective case studies start with the author's own practice and then link it to the literature. Each piece concludes with the author's top tips for supporting each in the context of diversity. The seven top tips from all educators are summarised in the final section of this special issue. It is with great pleasure that I now introduce the individual pieces. The first essay by Teresa Elms introduces and reviews the idea of cultural capital. Elms uses the concept of cultural capital as a lens through which to understand participation and non-participation in higher education, as well as a lens for understanding how students choose particular institutions and courses. She then relates the theoretical review of the literature to her own practice, working with students in the grand neo-Gothic Warren Library that is part of King's Library Services offering. 
Elms argues the differences in cultural capital continue to matter while students are in higher education. This can affect their comfort levels, their understanding of tacit information and the hidden curriculum that allows students to navigate the language and culture of higher education and how well students can meet unarticulated expectations. Different cultural background can also give insights into the approach to citing other people's works. Elms links those insights back to her own personal experience of higher education as well as showing how these insights provide an opportunity to address barriers. Her top tips for teaching in the context of diversity include explaining unfamiliar terms, making students aware of available support, providing clear instructions and consciously taking into account students' prior knowledge. The second essay is a reflection by Matthew Moran on the challenge of peer labelling in his teaching practice of leading a course on riots. Moran and other educators in the field of international security studies are no strangers to covering controversial and emotive issues and conflicts. However, the relationship between race and the London riots of 2011 developed an unexpected dynamic in Moran's own classroom when a student began to feel that his classmates were making an implicit link between him, his race and the riots. Drawing on labelling theory, Moran makes sense of the observations in his classroom. He considers how educators might plan their teaching to incorporate thinking about the possibility of peer labelling and stereotyping occurring as well as planning for harvesting the benefits of diverse classes and instilling a broad world view and an appreciation of diversity among his students. Moran's top tips include challenge assumptions from the outset and drawing on diversity as strength in the classroom. Jeff Garmany's essay begins with a perceived lack of diversity among his students. Garmany has developed a module on the cultural geography of Brazil and was hoping to cover the potentially controversial issues such as slavery, domestic violence, religion, environmental degradation and the socio-cultural construction of race and gender. However, it turned out that all participants in this course were white and male and Garmany was concerned that this lack of observed diversity among students would hinder constructive discussions. His review of the benefits of diversity in higher education highlights how reflective teachers can draw on diverse perspectives participants bring to classroom conversations as strength. Although Garmany also acknowledges the potential additional preparation and thinking time required in drawing on this strength. However, in his classroom, Garmany found that the lack of observed diversity among participants hindered discussions a lot less than he had expected with students happy to critically engage in a range of controversial discussions. This, in turn, leads Garmany to consider how he might have underestimated the actual non-observed diversity among students that is not easily reducible to skin colour or gender. Heterogeneous insights can thus be gained from learning groups that might appear homogenous on the surface. Crucial in the success of a discussion-based classroom is the teacher and his or her ability to lead discussions where students can voice and critically evaluate a range of perspectives and views. In the fourth essay, Deborah Chin addresses the frequently neglected issue of students in higher education who also have caring responsibilities. For these students, the choice of university and course is often influenced by their caring responsibilities with limited geographic mobility and some restrictions on the course requirements they might easily be able to combine with their role as carer. Carers might feel more isolated on campus and are time poorer than their peers without caring responsibilities. Chin describes the support available and recommendations for supporting carers in higher education, including the need for staff training and a positive framing of the contribution carers can make to the learning for others, as well as the potential for online or remote learning for carers. The essay highlights how there is great scope for universities to expand their commitment to carers and to develop further formal policies and support in this area. 
Chin's top tips include reflection of teachers' own assumptions about caring and a readiness to challenge those, e-learning support and reflecting caring in the curriculum. Sonia Lipzinska reflects on how best to create accessible learning materials that allow students with undisclosed disabilities to fully participate in her training sessions. She situated the piece in the context of her practice as an information specialist in library services. As part of her role, Lipzinska delivers a training sequence helping dental students prepare for a poster project. While the library service has a range of formal support available for students with declared disability, Lipzinska highlights how some students have an undisclosed disability and how an inclusively designed session can meet those needs as well. After reviewing the literature, she adopted a range of teaching practices to enhance inclusion. The changes range from avoiding jargon to providing material in different formats to having a clearly signposted lesson plan. The essay highlights how small and thoughtful changes are possible for any practitioner to enhance accessibility and inclusion in teaching. Lipzinska's top tips include making material available before the session, using a range of teaching techniques and not making assumptions about students' backgrounds and abilities. The sixth essay is a review of the teaching modes available to support epilepsy as an unseen disability in the context of teaching comparative literature. Maria Vaccarella observes that neither the social nor the medical model of disability exhaustively explains what happens in epilepsy. Epilepsy has low levels of disclosure. Vaccarella argues that supporting students with epilepsy needs to be a combination of individual support and a move towards universal design. She cites examples of innovative practices ranging from living arrangements to financial support. The essay concludes with a reflection on how learning about epilepsy has impacted Vaccarella's own approach to teaching by aiming to remove barriers to learning. Changes or anticipatory adjustments include making material available before the lesson, providing a glossary of new terms and providing enough information in written material so that students can undertake tasks remotely and thinking about audio-visual recordings of sessions. Claire Crowley's reflections concerns information literacy needs of distance learning medical students. One face-to-face -face session supports the information literacy skills of the students who otherwise learn remotely. In this practice context, it is key to flag up the support and resources available to students, to collaborate with academic faculty to encourage use of resources and to have informative and accessible online resources. After reviewing the literature and consultation with students and academic faculty, Crowley developed an interactive online module with quizzes and modular tutorials with linked videos as well as a new medical subject guide. Crowley's top tips include blended learning, using a range of delivery modes and activities, using screen capture and continually evaluating one's own practice in light of feedback. The essay also highlights the importance of linking up activities and communicating with users and other educators about the available resources. The final essay by Vivian Oryung reviews the development and running of a massive open online course, MOOC, in medicine's adherence. Oryung describes a range of issues that are particular to the context of MOOCs, such as the high enrolment but comparably low completion rate, the variability of student engagement and the ongoing discussions about how to make MOOCs sustainable. Or Jung reports that MOOCs have a tendency to increase the knowledge of those who are already highly educated and do not always succeed in reaching new groups of learners. The essay concludes that MOOCs on their own are unlikely to be a solution to enhancing access to education, and because of their large enrolment, personal support for weaker learners is not usually a feature of these programmes. However, future developments to enhance MOOCs might make them one option for accessible learning. 
A top tip for inclusive MOOCs is to transcribe video material to offer a range of ways for accessing materials. In working with participants in the teaching in the context of diversity module, I was humbled by the thoughtful and reflective dedication of my peers in enhancing the educational experiences of all students. The essays, the individual top tips for inclusive teaching in each contribution and the collected seven practitioners tips for teaching in the context of diversity at the end of the present special issue provide an unusual resource for educators within and outside Kings for making their practices more inclusive and accessible. I hope you will enjoy reading this special issue and the ideas and tips for inclusive teaching shared here. Anna Mountford Zimdars, guest editor.